You are mostly water, but you're also other stuff, some of which became part of your body because it was in the water that you drank. Some of it's good, like calcium, some of it's bad, like arsenic, and some of it is fluoride. There are certain states in the United States, certain areas of the United States, where the fluoride levels in the drinking water are low. Some people want it and are suing cities because they feel there wasn't enough of it, and others don't want any fluoride in their drinking water, and they're suing cities because of that. If you get too much fluoride into your system, it is dangerous. It is a poison at certain levels. If levels of fluoride in drinking water exceed a certain threshold, it can cause problems with thyroid hormone function and perhaps even certain aspects of brain function. Even in the standard concentrations that are present of, and here's an important number, 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. Well, I do enjoy debunking some pseudoscience from time to time. The reason fluoride is added to tap water is that health professionals all over the world recommend fluoride for preventing tooth decay as well as bone decay. It joins calcium and phosphate to form a mineral called fluoroapatite, which is incorporated into tooth enamel and is highly resistant to deterioration. We consume various food and drink throughout the day. Oral bacteria consume these carbohydrates and produce organic acids. These acids demineralize our enamel each time we eat and throughout the day. But we also drink water throughout the day. If we are drinking fluoridated water, then our teeth are getting fluoride that remineralizes enamel at roughly the same frequency as our eating demineralizes enamel, and with fluoroapatite instead of hydroxyapatite. And can potentially fill in little cavities that have not yet made it to the deeper layers. There are a lot of things that we can do to strengthen our teeth in natural ways by building up those hydroxyapatite bonds, which are the natural bonds that teeth form. Fluoride was discovered not because it's a vitamin, not because it's an essential nutrient. In fact, at high concentrations, it's actually a poison. I don't like calling it a poison without considering dosage, but I also don't like that the dental industry and the government say that you need fluoride. It does make it sound like an essential nutrient. The official recommendation from the NIH is for adults to get four to 10 milligrams of fluoride each day. The minimum is based on adequate cavity prevention. We'll get into that later. And the maximum based only on the risk of skeletal fluorosis. In other words, they make no consideration that fluoride might affect the body outside of the bones and teeth because these claims are debated and more research is necessary. But this is a double standard when you look at their statement that fluoride does strengthen bones before admitting that it might not and that more research is necessary. If you consume fluoridated water or use toothpaste with fluoride, the structure of the teeth becomes ultra strong, meaning super physiologically strong. I don't like that Huberman says that fluoride in your teeth is not natural. Rainwater is very close to pure H2O, but the drinking water on earth has always had some fluoride in it. So we can assume that teeth bearing life forms have always had fluoride in our teeth. Groundwater, the main drinking water source in developing countries, has highly variable natural fluoride levels depending on location. I found a spreadsheet with the natural levels of 38,000 groundwater wells across the US and the median fluoride levels were 0.2 milligrams per liter. The government tries to get the level to 0.7 in your drinking water, which is a lot higher, but it's not as high as the untreated drinking water in a lot of places, especially when you look globally. At first glance, fluoridation seems kind of like circumcision where American doctors are like, oh yeah, you need, you need to do that. And Europeans are like, you considered maybe not chopping part of your dick off. But it's easier for Scandinavian countries like Denmark to ban fluoridating their water because their oral health is better than ours, they have free health care, and it seems like they have much higher naturally occurring levels of fluoride in the drinking water. I mean, just look at these levels in Hostiladelegivgarder. They're through the roof. I couldn't get any national averages for Europe, but in southeastern Sweden, for example, a quarter of the private wells have fluoride over 1.5 milligrams per liter. Also in Sweden, they put poetry in their science papers. Fluoridated water is actually the first method by which we used fluoride for cavity prevention. All other forms of fluoride for oral health are based on original research with fluoride of a natural origin in water, proposed adding a small amount of fluoride to drinking water in order to achieve the same reduction in cavities that those researchers observed for children living in communities where fluoride levels were naturally about one part per million. 
let's put fluoride in the drinking water. They did not do this because it was necessarily the best way to take care of teeth. It was a fairly low cost approach for these cities to introduce fluoride to the drinking water. And some, not all of the dentists I spoke to, said it would be best to remineralize the teeth, building up of those hydroxyapatite natural bonds. But they acknowledged that many people don't take adequate care of their mouths and their teeth, so they understood the rationale of putting fluoride into drinking water. And of course, that's also why fluoride is in many, not all, toothpaste. First, there is the idea that fluoride toothpaste made water fluoridation obsolete. It is a reasonable thing to wonder if you haven't looked into it. Fluoridated water is a baseline source of fluoride that is quite helpful for times in our lives we are not consistently brushing. Not all people can or do brush, and even the most health conscious and oral hygiene focused people have off days or get illnesses that make basic oral hygiene tasks difficult. Even for those of us who are consistent with brushing the recommended twice a day for two full minutes, fluoridated water provides a base of cavity protection that is better matched with the pattern and timing of the sugar acid challenges of normal eating habits. Fluoridated water keeps a trace amount of fluoride in our saliva available to remineralize enamel all day long, rather than just during the two times a day we ideally brush. Questioning whether fluoride in water is important when we have other forms of fluoride is a reasonable question, but it is kind of like asking whether seat belts are necessary because we have airbags in our vehicles. It's more like asking if you should take a multivitamin given that you can get nutrients from food, or maybe more like asking about the benefits of oral versus topical medication for your toenail fungus that when you go to the beach makes you feel really self-conscious about myself. What most of us probably should be thinking about anyway is trying to increase the remineralization state of our teeth and mouth in ways that don't create the opportunity for any other health hazard. Huberman's main point is very valid. If you take good enough care of your teeth, you don't need fluoride to wind up with zero cavities. And although the harms of fluoride are debated, when you put substances in your body, they usually affect more than just your bones. Huberman has a lot of good advice on oral health that can help you avoid cavities. He can be a little wordy, which is why I've made so many cuts to condense his episodes down. Okay, so let's talk just briefly, I promise, briefly. I have an orange tree in my backyard now and I absolutely love it. I love oranges, grapefruit, but here's the point. If you are somebody who enjoys getting your teeth drilled, well then uh, I don't know what to say. But I'm not just going to throw a bunch of names out there for sake of nomenclature. I don't need to cloud your hippocampus. I don't bite the dentist anymore because you get charged for that or your insurance gets charged for that. How much is fluoride in drinking water harming you? There are two things you need to ask. One is how much fluoride are you actually drinking? Because it turns out there's a tremendous range of fluoride concentrations in tap water depending on what city you live in. If you are on city water, you can check your zip code for free to get a rough estimate of what's in your tap water. EWG has tons of data taken at the utility over many years. Some of it's not that recent, but they will highlight the contaminants that are above their recommended levels, as well as fluoride levels. Simple Lab has their city water project with data sourced directly from household taps. They actually break into people's homes. I'm just kidding. They sell home test kits that you can buy, and they average out the data for each city and publish that online for free. If you're using well water, it is recommended to test it once a year. This video is not sponsored, but I do have affiliate links below, meaning if you purchase a test for your water, I will earn a commission. Fluoride has also been hypothesized to be neurotoxic under certain conditions. A lot of the evidence is from so-called in vitro studies, so studies done effectively in a dish, although there is some in vivo evidence that it can cause neurotoxicity, aka neurodegeneration. Those who push anti-fluoride sentiment will make the claim that it is a neurotoxin. But the evidence in those studies is shaky at best and can't be credibly used to support abandoning the fundamental role of fluoride in oral health. One of the early studies in the last decade was a meta-analysis of a bunch of studies in China and Iran. But the studies in the meta-analysis turned out to be of poor quality and didn't control for confounders like lead, arsenic, and naturally high levels of fluoride in groundwater, with IQ measurements for children in homes where coal is used for cooking meals with no ventilation. So these studies are not applicable to fluoridation in developed countries. There have been other studies since then which indicate the possibility of an association between fluoride and neurotoxic effects, but again, these studies had serious limitations. One of the well-known 
well-known authors in Canada, accepted an invitation to speak at a conference by a well-known quack organization. Her fellow headliners would include disgraced anti-vaxxer Andrew Wakefield and the COVID conspiracy theorist Judy Mikovits. In the meantime, researchers like Broadbent, but rather focus on doing valid science, have published studies that find no relationship between fluoridated water and IQ. Almost everything that you read about fluoride will have someone elsewhere saying the exact opposite. So if you read or watch something that convinces you one way, try and spend the same amount of time hearing the other side. That way you get to decide who had the better argument. It's really tempting to just read something that you want to believe or that you already agree with and stop there. But if you don't take the extra time to actively seek out opposing beliefs, you become narrow-minded, biased, you basically brainwash yourself. If someone tells you something without providing the source for that information, you need to seek out the source yourself before you just believe what they're saying. And if they did a study themselves, find out how they did it. You can't just read a one sentence conclusion and take it as fact. You either need to read the whole study or find criticism from people who have read the whole thing. There is a productive and respectful way to have a debate where both sides refine, improve their arguments, on the internet, people tend to not do that and just name call, try to make people feel stupid. Name calling is basically just you being unable to explain why you disagree with someone. If you do that in the comments below, I'm just gonna shadow ban you. It's fine to post a strongly worded critique of me or others, but if you're not sure if you're being a dick or not, just copy paste and ask ChatGPT. There are studies that show that the concentration of fluoride in drinking water is of particular concern for the thyroid hormone system of the body. It relates to everything from sleep to reproduction. Thyroid hormone is involved in many, many things, including bone health and tissue health generally. So essentially every biological process in your body is impacted by thyroid hormone. There is a study that I'd like to highlight, which was published in 2018. And the title of the study is Impact of Drinking Water Fluoride on Human Thyroid Hormones. This was a case control study. So this is not an extensive analysis of many individuals. However, what it shows is that fluoride negatively impacts thyroid stimulating hormone and so-called T3 levels, even in the standard concentrations that are present of, and here's an important number, 0 0.5 milligrams per liter. Again, I don't want to create a lot of scare. I'm not trying to trigger fear here. I do think, however, by way of reading this review, by way of reading the paper that I just referred to a moment ago, that there is extensive evidence that elevated levels of fluoride in drinking water are simply not good for us. If you are concerned about fluoride, the suggestion simply would be to filter that tap water. Um, many of those filters will filter out fluoride. And some people have enough disposable income and or are concerned enough about fluoride, purchase or create very extensive very thorough filtration systems to completely eliminate fluoride from their drinking water. Personally, I'm somebody who filters the drinking water, unless that is, I'm going to boil water with it. Just to be clear, boiling does not remove any fluoride. I think he probably said this because of the time it takes for a gravity filter to remove fluoride. Your typical Brita type filter is mostly for removing chlorine and bad tastes. In order to remove fluoride and other more difficult contaminants, you need a denser filter. So if it's only powered by gravity and not water pressure, the more effective the filter, the longer it tends to take. Filtering 1.9 liters with the filter that Huberman recommends can take 35 minutes, so it makes sense that he wouldn't want to do that for boiling pasta. And he says that he eventually... I recently purchased a whole house filter for the drinking water taps in my house so that it does remove all the fluoride and remove some other contaminants as well. Given that the cost of most of the filters that can remove most of the fluoride is low, and given that there is some health concern of consuming too much fluoride, why not just remove fluoride. So many super special waters that you can buy for a pretty penny instead of that awful, awful, practically free tap water we all have access to. Okay, so Huberman recommends filtering fluoride. Dave does not. For children, this issue gets super complicated. But for me personally, I believe that my oral hygiene is good enough to filter my water and still avoid cavities. But this decision has very little to do with fluoride itself because there are a whole host of other tap water contaminants that are more concerning to me. I mean, we're talking arsenic, forever chemicals, the Aaron Brockovich chemical, microplastics, fertilizers, pesticides, and disinfection byproducts like chloroform. I came upon these two videos researching tap water. I'm dozens of hours deep into research and there's no debate that zero is the ideal level of these contaminants in your water 
or in your body. It's too expensive for the government to remove arsenic, for example, to the levels that scientists would like, but it's not that hard or expensive to remove most of it at home. I've been using a Brita pitcher for years to filter chlorine and make my tap water taste better, but I recently have started testing out other filters that are a lot more effective. The filters that remove the substances I mentioned also tend to remove fluoride, and you heard from the pro-fluoride camp that the topical method represents the lion's share of benefits for adults. The anti-fluoride camp has not convinced me to avoid topical fluoride, like toothpaste touching your teeth and then you spit it out. So what I'm going to do personally is start filtering fluoride out of my water, but also start brushing with fluoride toothpaste. I've been using fluoride free for about 10 years. Not because I sought that out, I just thought I might as well buy my toothpaste from the health food store, and that's pretty much what they have there. I'm a little sad because this is the best tasting toothpaste I've ever tried. If you're avoiding fluoride, check out the link below. And if you have a recommendation for cinnamon toothpaste with fluoride, let me know. I'm also gonna plug these floss picks. Honestly, if you're still flossing with a single strand, like what are you, you also still using a fax machine? Like I'd recommend them even if they weren't PFAS free. I'm gonna talk a lot more about PFAS in the next video. My goal is to make a comprehensive guide to tap water and water filters. It's really hard to parse through the data between sensationalized marketing claims and wildly inconsistent third-party test results. But I hope to have that video done within a few weeks. So if you have any questions on tap water, please let me know and stay thirsty. No, that's stupid.